Privies are kind of a somewhat fancy term for outhouses. It's where people use the bathroom, going back in time. And we love digging in privies. My name is Joe Bagley and I'm the city archaeologist of Boston. Archaeologists that do historical archaeology love privies because, first of all, everybody had one, so that means that they're all over the place. They tend to be dug pretty deep, so that means that a lot can happen in places like cities where I am in Boston, and those sites can be well preserved. But the one reason why we really like them is that the data that's found in them, the trash that people throw out into them, represents a kind of unedited history. It's the stuff that people nobody thought would come and dig up in 100, 200, 300 years. And so we tend to get the stories of everyday life and sometimes the secrets of everyday life hidden in the privies. And when we find those, we are able to kind of piece together some of the more mundane but more interesting parts of the story of the past. This is actually a tiny little teapot spout from a child's tea set. So now we got the kids showing up on the site. Typically they're in backyards and they tend to be as far away from people's houses as they can possibly put them and that's for the obvious reason that they really smell terribly, especially in the summer. And what we're looking for are essentially a tiny house foundation or like a brick rectangle or a stone rectangle or even sometimes a wooden rectangle or a barrel even that were dug down into the ground and used to hold the feces for the family. Once we find those though, we have to be very careful because the data that's stored in these privies are unique and so we have to be very careful about how we excavate them and record everything that we find so that the information can be shared. It takes as many days to dig through these privies and we, we take tons of notes, tons of photographs, and every artifact that we find is carefully recorded as to exactly where we find it in the ground. None of this stuff is very fancy. In the 1800s, the renters that were living here were kind of lower middle class, if not lower class. If it was fancy, it would all be porcelain. You're using the trowel, then you just scrape a little bit, and all of a sudden you see maybe a broken dish or a piece of a glass. And that may be the first artifact you've seen in four feet of digging. And then you break out your brush and you brush around it, and as you brush around it, you might see another piece of it, and then suddenly you'll see another ceramic, and then another ceramic, and by the time you started to move out, you have a floor of just broken artifacts across the bottom of it. And it's really kind of that King Tut moment where you just see you know, wonderful things sitting at the bottom of your pit. It doesn't get much better than that. Everything in this bag is from about 1750 to 17, well, 1750s ish. Um, and this is one 10 centimeter level of a one by one meter area. Good Lord. I know. <laughs> Before the 1790s, we had enslaved people in Boston. One of the calling cards of the presence of an enslaved person on these sites is a cowrie shell. Um, it's a very small shell. They're not uncommon today. You can see them on many people's clothing and in hair. But in the 18th century, are fairly exclusively associated with the presence of enslaved people because people coming over from West Africa were bringing these shells, which are only found in West Africa, with them. In Africa, they were considered a spiritual object, but also um, used as a form of currency. And so they form kind of an identification of West African culture. And as people were being brought over from West Africa as enslaved people, they were keeping these cowrie shells, possibly without the knowledge of their enslavers, as symbols of their West African culture, continuing on despite the suppression that they were going through. It can be gross, it depends on kind of the heat and the humidity of the day. So like typically when we're digging privies, it's a dry middle of the summer and the artifacts inside of them and the feces inside of them has been fairly composted. We just did a dig in January on a privy and it was so cold that we couldn't smell anything. It's not often until we get back into our lab and we start washing off the artifacts with some warm water that we can start to get a whiff of what this used to be. But the good news is, is that a lot of the contents of these privies have been composting for so long, it's not any worse than if you had a compost pile in your yard. It can have a little bit of a smell, but it's nothing too bad. That's kind of part of the fun of it, really, is, is that kind of, you know what you're digging in every once in a while. And for me working in a city, I feel somewhat bad for the folks that are riding with me on the subway home when my boots may be covered in 300-year-old privy contents, but it's part of the job. Late 1600s, early 1700s one. Piece of flint, this is a rock that's actually only from England. The piece of pearlware made in the uh, late 1700s. The easiest part of my job is convincing the public that what I'm doing matters. And that's why Boston is the best place to do historical archeology. span People get it here, people appreciate it here, and the community itself backs the idea of the history that's in the ground is part of our identity.
it's a great career and it's an interesting career and it can take you to some really interesting places including outhouses in Boston's downtown.